They are working. They have been working for us for over 10,000 years. They have been called man's best friend, soft fur and wet nose, smart and loyal, aiding us in transportation, hunting, companionship, protection, and many more ways. They share a bond with us like no other animal. They are career dogs. And this is a look into the history, training, and duties of jobs that can only be fulfilled by our four-legged friends. In this program, we will take up dogs that have been bred to become part of working teams. They are the herding and sled dogs, dogs that have become an integral part of a way of life. Obedient. Lie down alert, and intelligent. A herding or stock dog is trained to oversee livestock, most importantly, cattle and sheep. A herding dog's job is to bring together individual animals into a group, maintain that group, protect them from predators and or move them from place to place. Any dog that exhibits herding instincts can be trained and it turns out that herding is a predatory behavior that has been modified from the original predatory behavior through selective breeding of wolves and their descendants. Humans were able to minimize the dog's inclination to look at cattle and sheep as prey while maintaining their predatory skills. Steve White is the owner of Mill Iron S Ranch, Idaho, where he breeds working border collies and is the president of the board for the Mountain States Stock Dog Association. We met up with him at the association's trials in Wyoming. So the, the history of a herding dog, I mean, it goes clear back when. It was originally uh, for sheep. You know, they were, the shepherds used them for sheep to control their flocks. Uh, they've evolved a lot over the years. Um, they've bred them now to where they're strong enough to work cattle. Um, with the sheep, uh, we, you know, they, we didn't, you don't like them to ever bite them or, or do anything like that. And so what we've done with the breeding of the Border Collie dog, make them to breed cattle, is you have to breed a little stronger dog, a little stronger wheeled dog to be able to handle the pressure that, a, you know, a mad cow might have was they're wanting to, to, to push them around. But uh, over the years, uh, even in the last 10 years, the, the breed has progressed immensely. The most common herding breeds in America are the Australian Shepherd Cattle Dog, the Border Collie, Corgi, and Shetland Sheepdog. Collies and Shepherds, they all herd by nipping at the heels of livestock and are such called healers. The Cardigan and Pembroke Welsh Corgi excel at herding smaller livestock, such as chickens, goats, sheep, and pigs. Their tenacity and pushiness becomes an asset in the herding world, as well as their shorter stature to evade cow's kicks. They also work well as more than one corgi for bigger groups of livestock. The Border Collie uses what is called the strong eye to get in front of animals and stare them down. A strong eye in a, in a dog, is, as we watch these dogs today, um, if you watch them, I could point out a stronger eyed dog. Um, uh, we call it, or I'll call it a tighter eyed dog, a tight eyed dog, or a strong eyed dog. You'll see them and they'll really focus. I mean, they'll get up to a cow and they'll lock on to a, 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 a one particular animal. And, and they hold that eye contact and try to push on them. And sometimes they lose focus of other, the other stock. And, and the thing about herding is we're wanting to keep everything in a group. We don't want a single one out. And so a strong-eyed dog, you, we like a strong-eyed dog, but we also like them to be a little bit, we call loose-eyed dog, to, to the, why they're focused on this cow here, that they know I gotta keep this corner and I gotta keep this corner and try and keep everything together.
many people have uh, observed the behavior of a border collie or any of these kind of long distance herding dogs, not the, not the healers, but the long distance herding dogs, um, when they see their sheep or whatever their flock is, the first thing they do is go down low and then they orient that visual streak, that horizontal streak, to get as much acuity as possible as to how far away those sheep are. And this um, is something that, she that anybody that um, uses sheep dogs today knows about. It's something that we look for. We want a dog with a good, with a good eye, right? And what we're, what we're referencing there is this visual streak. Um, it can be disconcerting. And as, uh, as someone that spent time in Scotland and Northern England, it's, you can suddenly find yourself being given the eye by several border collies as they, as they try to herd you, uh, but it's just their way of gathering information. There are a few traits that all herding dogs have in common, such as athletic build, a hardy coat for working outdoors, and a keen intelligence. They are also agile, protective, and loyal. You might know if you have a potential herder on your hands if your dog likes to round up you, your cat, or your kids. Puppies are often raised with their flocks or herds to establish a sense of a pack and form a working relationship. How a herd knows to respect the dog is within the first few seconds, minutes, whatever, that the, uh, that the dog encounters the stock. They're both reading each other. Um, you can watch as you watch. Today in this trial, you'll see dogs will have a lot of presence, you know, will come up and, and the stock will see if they're bluffing or maybe he's not serious or maybe he's serious and so I'm gonna give and respect what he's wanting me to do. And so that's usually established pretty quick um, between them and some stock is a little rougher on the dogs and, and some dogs aren't confident enough to or have the presence to control the stock you know and so it's a, it's a it's a take and give on both sides herding dogs develop the ability to know what's going to happen next in their herd for example the herding dog can detect which way a stock animal will turn by watching where it looks on their way to working the ranch stock dogs start with basic obedience training at the same time, it's important to exercise these busy dogs' minds and bodies. Lack of mental stimulation can lead to bad habits. After basic training, they move on to advanced obedience classes, where they learn more complicated commands. These can include cast, gather the stock into a group, find, search for stock, and come by and away to me, go to the left or right of the stock. The commands can be indicated by hand movement, a whistle, or a voice. I always start with the down. You can teach the down on a leash and stuff. But I've, I've found out that it's a lot easier to teach them in a, you use a round pin and use like goats or sheep or something, something kind of little. And, they, and you can use your commands there and they, they pick them up pretty easy. Well, the most important one is down. You want the dog to, so usually people use a whistle for that or just the down command. And then uh, when you work on a dog, you do clockwise around the cattle or counterclockwise. And so clockwise around the cattle is come by and then uh, counterclockwise is away. And that's, that's kind of how a dog's mentality works is clockwise or counterclockwise and which, which eye is towards the cattle. I like to use a whistle. They can hear them a lot better in Wyoming. The wind blows all the time. And they don't hear your voice necessarily, but they will hear a whistle. And you can differentiate, you know, you get these whistles that you can differentiate. You can use different pitches and stuff. So a relationship with a handler of a dog is, is, is the number one key that you have to have in this uh, situation with where we're working herding dogs or stock dogs. There has to be utmost respect on both sides. Um, for me, you, it's almost an alpha relationship. I'm, and I don't mean you need to go be rough with your dog or anything like that, but as you're working with your dog and you say, 
away to me, which is go to the right. They have to take that command because you said so, even though their natural instinct is telling them, you know, get back over here and hold them together. So as these dogs go, as I work a dog or as I'm training a young dog, we strive for what I call obedience, you know, or everybody calls obedience, but the dogs that will do the best as they get done, or we strive to be perfectly obedient. And those are the dogs that will do the best is because you have to work together in a team. The dog has to have the ability to go out there and handle the stock on their own, but also the ability to listen to say what, you know, to what you're telling him to do. Herding or fetching dogs will get to the front of a group of animals to turn or stop them, while healers or driving dogs keep the animals moving forward. These maneuvers are similar to how humans used hunting dogs to corner bears and prey animals for the kill. There's the border collie and they would be the herders. They naturally want to bring the cattle to you and hold them to you. Um, the blue healers are probably more the drive dogs. And then they do use some like curs and stuff and those would be for in brush. They go and they're head dogs and they'll go in and the brush and get the cattle out. They may take commands from a human or work alone. Uh, mostly you, you always want them with you. I mean, they're part of your team. You don't want them to just go out and do what they want on their own. Like you can send them, I mean, half mile away and they'll, then they're kind of working on their own. But, but there's always a human there. Herding dogs are so good at what they do, they often compete in competitions called trials. In competition, the dogs, under the command of their handler, move stock animals around an enclosure, move them through a course of fences and gates while competing against time. The trial dogs have to be, have pretty much everything. They have to have speed and they have to listen very good because there's a lot of leeway on a ranch, but when you get in a trial, there's not much leeway on, if your dog overflanks by a couple feet, he's gonna ru ruin your run. So they have to be pretty, and they have to be pretty strong dogs to be able to get the cattle moving. As I think about the relationships with our dogs, it, it's, it's a really close relationship because of what they've done for us over the years, the m amount of, of money they've saved us, the amount of work that they put in. I mean, every day I go out, and we go to work, the dog never calls in sick, the dog never is not happy to go work. They live to work and they live to please us. And so the relationships with our dogs are they're very close because of that fact. Of, is, it's not just a throwing a bone or anything, it's they're part of our livelihood and they make our living possible because they're living to work for us and to please us. You know, we, we can't force these dogs to work. They either want to work or they don't want to work. And so, as much as I love to work my dog, my dog loves to go work for me also. A team of dogs pulling a sled in pristine snow is a remarkable sight and an even more remarkable experience. For cultures that lived in cold, snowy climates around the Arctic, the question has always been, how did they manage to get around? Sled dogs, of course. Anthropological evidence showed that 9,000 years ago, the domestic dog was present in what is now Zhakov Island of Arctic Northeastern Siberia. Mushing is a sport or transport method that is powered by dogs, or more specifically, a sled pulled by dogs on snow or a rig on dry land. The Inuit people of North America used dogs to pull sleds and toboggans for hundreds of years. A Comatic is a sled designed to travel on snow and ice and would be pulled by a dog team. The runners of the Comatic would be coated with slippery mud and layers of water to build up an ice crust. Besides pulling sleds and loads, the Inuit used dogs to run down wolves, caribou, muskox, and even polar bears until men arrived with harpoons. When seal hunting, they would sniff out the holes where the seals came up to breathe. The best known Arctic sled dog breeds are the Alaskan Malamute, Siberian Husky, and Samoyed. Sarah and Dan Piano are the co-owners of Snow Buddy Sled Dog Tours, based in Oak Creek, Colorado. Sarah told us more about the history of the sled dog. Verbally, 
Moshing is um, a word that originally came from French, is the French verb moshe, that was sort of anglicized to mush, and it was just a, a word that people used to drive dogs. Um, but it's not real prevalent anymore uh, for a lot of reasons, mostly because we don't speak French. Um, it's still, for tradition, we use the word, we call ourselves mushers, but it's the act of driving dogs, mushing. Initially, there were three Arctic breeds up north. There was the Samoyed Husky, the Malamute Husky, and the Siberian Husky. And they were all called Huskies just because they pulled sleds. They weren't bred for anything other than to work. And they weren't bred for appearance, they were just bred to perform. It was more important that they were good at their job, that they had a strong desire to pull, really good attitude towards work, an appetite that didn't quit, and a decent coat for living in Arctic conditions. And um, they had, you know, different disciplines. The Samoyed was originally a dual purpose breed, it was for both herding reindeer and for pulling sleds. Um, the Siberian Husky was more for traveling over distance, you know, running a trap line, that kind of thing. And the Malamute was a freight dog, so pulling heavy, heavy loads over potentially long distances, but not at very high speeds. The most important thing that separates sled dogs from other breeds is the ability to withstand cold. These dogs were selectively bred to be between 35 to 55 pounds at maturity, a weight ideal to maintain their core internal temperature in extreme cold. Depending on its use, the fur of an Arctic dog can be dense and warm to hold heat in the case of freight sled dogs, or short to let heat out for sprint sled dogs. Most sled dogs have a double coat, an outer layer to keep snow away from the body, and an inner waterproof layer for insulation. There are many other traits that make the sled dog special. Originally bred for strength and stamina, today they are also bred for speed and endurance. The endurance is incredible. Um, these guys are the most incredible athletes on the planet, honestly. I mean, they have done studies on these dogs where they actually have, they show signs of they recover while they're working. Um, they can actually continue to run and, and recover. So um, it, they're incredible athletes. What we do here is just kind of a warm up for them. You know, we go eight to 12 miles a tour. Um, these dogs are used to going 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 miles a day. Remarkably, these athletes can run up to 28 miles per hour and cover 100 miles in a day. Their feet are webbed and tough with closely spaced toes to act as snowshoes. Their bushy tail cover their nose and feet while they sleep to keep them from freezing. And they have a unique arrangement of blood vessels in their legs to protect against frostbite. And then there is their temperament. Sled dogs in general uh, just what we're looking for more than anything is attitude and appetite. That was Lance Mackey's um, phrase he coined originally. Attitude towards work is really important. They need to want to run and pull and uh, they need to have an appetite that doesn't quit because if you're going to ask a dog to run over distance and, and then do it again, they need to eat well so they can recover just like a human athlete. So their nutrition is super important. We're always managing the dogs individually, uh, working on a nutrition program and an exercise program that helps the dog succeed in our little program. Amazingly, sled dogs can survive sleeping outside in the Arctic at night, where other pack animals would perish. They are hardy and independent, sometimes interbreeding with wolves. Their blood is wild and free, living almost entirely outdoors. The Call of the Wild is a successful adventure novel by Jack London that tells the story of a sled dog named Buck. It explores the trials and tribulations of being a sled dog and becoming a leader in the wild. Several movie adaptations of the novel have been made since, as well as other sled dog movies, including Snow Dogs, Eight Below, and Iron Will. And then there is one 1995 animated film made about one of the most famous dogs in the world. In 1925, doctors realized a deadly diphtheria epidemic was about to sweep through Nome, Alaska's young people. The serum that could stop the outbreak was in Anchorage, and the only way to get it to Nome was a sled dog team. More than 20 mushers took part in a minus 23 degree below zero race to get the serum to the dying people of Nome. The event was covered worldwide. The longest and most treacherous stretch was covered by the dog Togo, and the lead of one team, Balto, a Siberian Husky, was able to stay on the trail in near whiteout conditions in the dark.
Balto safely delivered the serum to Nome, and his musher, Gunnar Kaysen, shared the fame with his dog. A statue of Balto was erected in New York City's Central Park. Balto's body can be viewed in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Today, the job of the sled dog has mostly been replaced by snowmobiles, but dog sled racing sports and tourist sledding attractions remain. The Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race is an annual long distance race that runs from Willow to Nome, Alaska, that commemorates the legacy of dog mushing. 16 teams cover the trail in eight to 15 days or more. The race is a popular event in Alaska. And there is always recreational mushing. Snow Buddy Dog Sled Adventure Company, we take people out in the backcountry and take them on tours out here. Um, we started six years ago with kind of the mission to give racing dogs a second chance at something else. Um, some, a lot of dogs don't make the racing teams and um, we give them an opportunity to pull tours here. They don't have to be the A team dogs to work here. We take the B, C and D team dogs and do our best to rehabilitate them. And our ultimate goal is, you know, when they're done working here is to find them pet homes. The whole thing really is a reflection of my heart. So I'm an adventurer and I'm a real hands-on person. And I think that that's what we get feedback wise from people all the time, that um, it was really an adventure and it was super hands-on. And that's what people really like. They wanna be a part of the whole thing from start to finish. And we work tirelessly with these dogs on their social skills so that they can be handled effectively by any layperson who comes to work with them, whether it's somebody who's had dogs their whole lives or it's a person from, you know, we get people from all over the world. So people from big cities who've never even had a pet and that they will eventually, with our, with our help, become comfortable enough to handle and harness and hook up and drive their own dog sled out in the woods. Training a sled dog uh, happens pretty naturally if you have a pack of sled dogs already. If I were to just get one dog and want to train it in harness, it would be um, a lot about the relationship that I developed with that dog. But I mean, honestly, you put a chihuahua on a leash and it wants to pull you around. So dogs want to work very naturally. So you just have to sort of help them develop that ability. Um, when you've got a big working kennel, just integrating the puppies into the program, um, as soon as they're developed enough to really be working full time is an important aspect. But from the time that they're really little, we have them around. They're always a part of this whole social scene because that's what can be really overwhelming for a dog if they're not used to living in a pack of 30 potentially unrelated animals that can be really emotionally taxing for them. So from the time they're really little, they watch the whole thing happen. They um, start putting on their harnesses and just getting them taken off and they don't go out for the run. And then someday when they're big enough, um, which is a controversial question when a sled dog is actually mature enough to be running and pulling full time. Um, but then eventually they get integrated into the team and that's the big day when they finally made it. And we start out really slowly with pups. They, they learn how to, how to march. They just learn to always pull and uh, eventually you start miling them up and, and taking them on longer runs and kind of seeing what they're made of if, if you're going to race. Putting together a sled team is a lot more work than you'd think. The dogs must be in a balanced team, organized by their strengths and weaknesses, and their speed and length of gait must be matched. They are put into pairs with a central toe line between them. The faster dogs go in front, behind a lead dog that sets the pace with strong wheel dogs in front of the sled, steering it and swerving it away from dangers. The important thing in, in my life, you know, with a lead dog is just that the dog is um, bonded well enough to me to respond when I ask the dog to do something. So it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, attitude certainly comes into play. Dogs need to be um, they need to be emotionally tough enough to run in front of a team because dogs are predators, so by nature they're going to enjoy chasing things, but they won't necessarily enjoy the, the thrill of being chased. So that takes a dog who has a lot of um, emotional fortitude. And not all dogs have that. Some dogs are very bottom of the pack dogs. The dogs follow the verbal commands of the musher, who watches the dogs closely to make sure the team is performing well. Uh, ready hike means go, easy whoa, stop. G means go to the right, um, ha, left, easy, it's like it's kind of slow down. But they do work as a team because they're all hooked up to the gang line together, um, but in essence they are not really looking out for each other as teammates. Like if one trips or falls, the rest of them don't necessarily stop. Um, 
But yeah, to pull the sled down the trail, they all are working together. And, and there are so many similarities between dogs and humans. Um, yeah, they all have their own personalities. Certain dogs work together really well with each other. Certain ones don't. They have quarrels and arguments. One day, you know, they're working together well with one team and you gotta switch it up because the next day they're not getting along. Dan and Sarah took us out for a sled ride. It's hard because they don't talk to me in a language that, that I can easily understand. So the way that you kind of bridge that gap is just time. You just have to spend a lot of time with them, watching them and learning what they really are. And um, I think our tendency as people is, you know, we're very anthropomorphic as a rule. We have a, a tendency to project how we think and feel about things onto dogs. And we run into occasionally um, people who call and want to talk about the ethical side of this business and whether or not the dogs really should be running and working and pulling in harness. And um, I always challenge people to just come and see to just come and see what this is about and to really see the dogs work and run and, and then potentially develop an opinion on it because I think it's really easy to look at, at a fat old golden retriever who spent the whole of its life on a couch and, and think that dog would never want to do this, but it's apples and oranges, you know, that these dogs have been bred for centuries to run and pull and harness and it's really in their hearts to do this. And it's um, not nearly as natural for them to be confined as it is for them to just travel all day long like they like to do. I've learned a lot about myself in working with with dogs and and really um, they they're they're really inspirational I'd say that that's the the most um, contagious thing about them is just their energy and I think that when you really allow yourself um, the space to get to know dogs for what they really are that you open yourself up to understanding better what exactly it is that you are and that's that's the most important thing for me I think in my bond with them is just recognizing and appreciating the differences between us and then cultivating as well the the things that that we have in common you know I was a, um, a distance runner all of my young life I ran at a, at a big college and I was kind of always on the razor's edge of of uh, my best performance ever and just crippling injury and I think that that's kind of where these dogs live too they really push themselves because that's what's in their hearts and some of them just don't have the talent and ultimately that's where I found myself I, I didn't have the talent to be a D1 distance runner for four years and when I when I got into mushing and I and I realized there were all these dogs who were like other people's cast-offs it was something that really spoke to my heart so for me to to find animals who I really felt like were kindred spirits, but then recognize over the years where we're really different and, and learn a lot from them in that respect as well. You know, what animals really are and what, what drives them and then what subsequently drives me. Whether it's sledding or stock dogs, they have helped people survive and prosper for thousands of years.